Okay, so you guys are on mute. Yes. Um, and you said now's a good time to introduce ourselves. Would be my take on it? Or should we wait? I wasn't sure. You're good to go. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Kim Dow. I'm one of the third year residents at Swedish First Hill. I'm pretty excited to do our presentation today. Um, apologize in advance for those who went to our R3 talks. You'll see definitely some similar slides in the beginning. <laughs> I'll let Kendall introduce me. And I'm Kendall Shibuya, and I'm at R3. Okay, should we share a slide, Kendall? And we will share. Uh, oops, I'm going to exit out of this just for a second. Folks, see this okay? Yep. Awesome. All right. So we will be presenting on the perils of screen time and the power of play. Our objectives today will be to understand how people are using screens today, be able to describe the harms of screen time, understand the benefits of play, and then know how to provide a prescription for play and physical activity. This is our outline. We're going to be starting with a game called Name That Icon. We'll talk about some statistics about screen time and the effects of it on our health. And then Kendall will switch gears to the power of play and physical activity and then um, how to approach this. Okay, so um, before we start, uh, for those who were not at the R3 talks, um, Usually ground rounds are in person, and so I was hoping for some participant uh, uh, participation through the chat. So, um, or I don't know if people are able to, to speak or not, but um, I'll be showing you some icons of different apps or website platforms um, that people spend a lot of their time on. So if you want to just type in the chat or if you're able to speak out um, and name that icon. So we'll start off with some social networking websites or apps. And I will pull up the chat. Any takers? We got Facebook from John Stevens. Thank you. And Twitter. Nailed it. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. All right. And okay. How about these microblogging? We got Instagram and Tumblr, excellent. John Stevens is winning so far. <laughs> oh. How about these? These are video platforms. We got TikTok, Snapchat, and YouTube, excellent. Messaging apps. <laughs> yes, Claire, you nailed it. <laughs> All right, we got WhatsApp, Group Me, and for the win, Discord. Thank you, John. Where's Claire? <laughs> One more. What's this person? What's this? What are these little bubbles? This is WeChat, much more popular uh, in I'm not sure. <laughs> um, a messaging app primarily used in China, but available here as well. Okay, and how about video chatting? We're on one of these platforms right now. We got Skype, Zoom. FaceTime, what's this last one? There you go, Google Hangout, yes. For all our <laughs> non-iPhone users. <laughs> Excellent, okay, and last but not least, something I'm sure you're all very aware of, 
and I, you'll probably get the last two because <laughs> the name is right in the icon. <laughs> Excellent. We've got Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, and HBO Max. Awesome. All right. So thank you for humoring me. Um, we do have a poll um, if people are able to participate, and then it will be popping up on your Zoom soon. Oh, someone didn't check their phone in the last <laughs> hour. That's impressive. <gasps> One out of three people <laughs> have not checked their phone. All right, we'll move on to the next question. This is pretty good. <laughs> three people about for a zero to two hours of recreational time. Excellent. About one person on two to four hours. Cool. And for time's sake, we'll move on to the next one. How much recreational time do you think the average adolescent spends? And I hope people get this right because I did review <laughs> this during the last time. We got folks split 50-50 between four to six and over six. All right. And this is an extra slide from last time, uh, from, not from last time. How much recreational time do you think an average adult spends on a screen per day? Recreational time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a split between two to four hours and four to six hours. Okay, thank you very much for sharing those. All right, so we will keep things rolling. So um, we talked about last time how the average screen time for adolescents is actually seven hours and 22 minutes, and this is not including time spent um, on screens for school or um, homework. And for adults, um, the little caveat with the adults is the, it, this is from one of the studies. Um, I just picked, honestly, the study that had the largest, <laughs> but uh, the range was actually 11 to 13 and a half hours of screen time. This does not um, split hours between work and recreational time, um, but this was one of the numbers proposed. Um, and this is data collected from during the COVID-19 pandemic. So pretty, pretty crazy there. All right, so now we'll talk about the perils of screen time. So what are adolescents spending their time on screens? Like, what are they doing? A lot of it is TV and videos. Um, then we have gaming, social media, and browsing websites, and then this other category that can include video chatting, e-reading, um, or like content creation. And this is from 2019, and this is from 2020. Um, and this is where I got the 1328. There have been other studies that propose like around 11 hours with a different breakdown. I just happen to like this graph. Um, so you'll notice here the two biggest chunks are really app slash webs on a smartphone, so over four and a half hours. And then for live TV, which I didn't even realize people were still watching, it was about <laughs> five and a half, which is pretty significant and much more than I thought. So why do we care about this? Um, we know that people are spending a lot of time and we know there are lots of apps out there, but why do we care about this? So it turns out spending a lot of time on looking at a screen is not good for your health. Um, I'll be taking a slightly deeper dive into obesity, but I still wanna go over these other problems or things that we should be considering. So for this next slide, I think, uh, those who are participating in this uh, webinar are very familiar with chronic neck and back pain, 
whether that's just from extended periods of time looking at a screen, um, in addition to just like an improper setup at home or even at work. And so I have this back to back of what we most of us probably do and what we should be doing. <laughs> it's all about those nine degrees, you guys. <laughs> Next is sleep problems. And so I think many of us, um, when we talk to our patients about sleep hygiene, one of the things we mentioned is no screens before bedtime. And part of that is that um, signals to our brain from the lights of, from our phones of really signaling to our brain, hey, it's not quite time for bedtime. Our body doesn't release that melatonin yet and really kind of preventing a good night's rest. And then mental health. Um, and this is kind of a, a brief thing that I'll go over because it it is its own presentation as you all, for those who went to the R3 talks. Um, so spending a lot of time in front of screens can negatively impact your mental and emotional well-being. Um, we know that there is this actually dose response relationship in smartphone use or screen time use and social media use um, that can increase mental distress, um, self-interest behavior, suicidality among teens and or among youth, but also adults. Um, we think that the kind of pathophysiology between uh, folks who use a lot of screen times on their phones is kind of is related to dopamine. Um, it's almost like when you're taking a drug and you get that release of dopamine and your body thinks, oh, this is something that's good for me. It's, it's kind of similar idea behind like getting those likes or seeing a show that you really like. Um, you get that that surge of dopamine telling your body, hey, maybe this is OK. Um, one thing that I, I stumbled upon while making this presentation that I thought was interesting. There was a survey, I think it was from 2015, that talked about how about one third of children actually felt like uncared for um, when, when their parents or their friends uh, would be looking at their phones or responding to a text message or whatever, um, instead of being engaged with them. So something else to consider about the impacts of, of, um, on personal relationships myopia. Um, and so for all those optometrists out there and ophthalmologists, the, the increase in digital screen time and being near work and the decrease of time outdoors has actually been associated with the um, earlier onset and progression of nearsightedness. And this can definitely be something that they're studying about. Has this been even worsened during this COVID uh, pandemic? And lastly, can too much screen time change our brain chemistry? So this is a question um, that the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study um, was exploring. Essentially, they looked at brain scans um, from nine and 10 year olds who had more than seven hours of screen time compared to those who had less. And what they saw was that the cortex was thinner in those with more screen time. Um, and obviously the cortex are thinking of decision-making, higher level thinking. Um, and so not, um, we're not really sure what this means, but this kind of suggests that there may be a connection between screen time and brain development. And there was another show, study that showed that greater, there was a greater performance on mental and academic tests when screen time was less than two hours, but also um, when you had a well-balanced diet and um, regular uh, sleep at least eight to 10 hours, and that's kind of where that 75210 comes from. Okay, and then what we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on is obesity. So spending too much time engaging in sedentary activities, um, like playing video games, watching TV, can be a risk factor for obesity. Um, and obviously heart health can be impacted by this, which can also lead to greater risk of diabetes, increased blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera. Um, when looking at TV viewing, TV viewing specifically in childhood obesity, as we know that um, just from some of the surveys, this is what many kids and adults spend their time doing. They show if we found that kids um, who follow children over longer periods of time found that children who watch more TV were actually more likely to gain excess weight, um, and then children with TV sets in their bedrooms um, were also more likely to gain excess weight than kids who don't, and then early TV habits may have long lasting effects um, as well. And so they found that um, children who were followed from birth uh, found that TV viewing in childhood actually predicts obesity risk in uh, adulthood and in midlife. And then when we look at TV viewing and um, adult obesity, we see we find that more people who like 
more television people watch, the more likely they are to gain weight or become um, overweight or obese. And then for every two hours spent watching TV, there's a risk of developing diabetes, heart disease, and early death. And those increases are by 20, 15, and 13 percent respectively, which I thought was pretty astounding. And so why do we think screen time increases the risk of obesity? Essentially, it displaces the time for physical activity. It enables sedentary activity um, for the most part, um, but it could also promote a poor diet. And so this is whether it's like mindless eating, you're not really paying attention to what you're doing, and it just gives another opportunity for possible unhealthy snacks. Um, and there's some studies being done right now about exposure to food and beverage marketing on TV. There's an association right now, but no like statistically significant studies, but I did think that was interesting. All right, and so I'm gonna switch gears to Kendall. So too much screen time equals too little playtime and physical activity. And this is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently as I've been spending probably too much time on my screen myself, mostly work related, but still too much time, not enough time exercising. And also as I'm raising two boys right now who are growing up in a digital age, I'm thinking about how am I going to protect them from these perils of screen time. And I think about it a lot also when counseling patients and who are overwhelmed and stressed and trying to tell them to limit their screen time, or take one thing that maybe is, that they're perceiving as helping them away from them is really, it's a really hard conversation. And I think sometimes it's helpful to frame that discussion in, in things that we know are beneficial for kids and for adults and brainstorm how we can include more of that in our lives um, rather than thinking about everything that we need to cut out. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about the power of play and then the power of physical activity. So with the power of play, I think this quote by Stuart Brown, who is a, um, he's a psychiatrist who has devoted his career to the study of play, and he's the founder of the National Institute for Play, he says, the opposite of play is not work, the opposite of play is depression. And this quote struck home for me um, a lot, particularly this year, I think, because a lot of of you know, ourselves, we're definitely social beings and we're not, we haven't had the opportunity to play with our, our peers as much. Um, and we definitely hear this in our patients right now. Um, this is my screen in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is something that the AAP has talked a lot about also. Um, this is the 2018 clinical report on the power of play the power of play a pediatric role in enhancing development in young children and this report really details the importance of play and emphasizes the role of primary care providers in advocating for play by educating families about the importance but really also um, being advocates in our communities telling school administrators and politicians how important it is that we maintain the opportunity for kids and adults to play so what is play? I think that's a little bit of an elusive definition. A lot of people who are in that play science world, which there is a world of play science out there, <laughs> um, say that you know it's, it's tough to pin down, but at, at its core, it's purposeless. Um, there really isn't like an end goal for it. It's all consuming and it's fun. There's like an inherent attraction to it. You don't have to force somebody to do it. And when, when doing it, you kind of get to escape from time a little bit. There are some different categories of play. And some of these we're familiar with as we're doing our developmental screening, we think we're thinking about a lot of these things. So there's object play, um, which is that early sensor motor explorations and using symbolic objects. There's physical play or that kind of rough and tumble play. Um, which is really essential for helping to promote an active lifestyle, which will help prevent obesity. Um, and it's also important because it helps enable like a safe place for people to take those risky behaviors and kind of learn their boundaries and it helps foster and develop emotional intelligence. There's also outdoor play, um, which helps sensory integration skills, addresses motor, cognitive, social, and linguistic domains. Um, and I think even related to what Kim was saying about the myopia, there's some studies that saying just, even just being out in the sunlight, having the eyes, like the pupils have to constrict to the sunlight helps with the eye health too. So there's a lot of benefits there. Um, and there's evidence that countries that have more recess uh, for young children 
see greater academic success among the children as they mature. And then their social play or pretend play. And this is a time where people, the kids and adults get to learn to negotiate the rules and learn to cooperate and their self-directed play, free play. There's also kind of the divisions of independent or more structured play um, and then more physically active play, which is creative or both combine them. So play, what does play do? So play is not frivolous, it is brain building. It leads to changes at the molecular, cellular, and behavioral levels for rat studies. And it shows upregulation of BDNF, this brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is important in long-term and social learning. And the BDNF, um, it supports the survival of existing neurons and encourages growth and differentiation of new neurons and synapses. And there's studies that are showing this is downregulated in adversity, stress, and depression. Play also activates norepinephrine, which facilitates learning at synapses and improves brain plasticity. And it's also one of the things that's related to our brain chemistry and depression. Um, high amounts of play are also associated with lower levels of cortisol. So I think we all kind of kind of intuitively know there are a lot of benefits of play. It helps with executive functioning, helps with the development of language, early math skills, social development, peer relationships, physical development, learning those motor skills, health, and enhanced sense of agency. And play, this is a nice quote from the AAP clinical report. At play enables children and adults to be passionately and totally immersed in an activity of their choice and to experience intense joy, which is a good thing. But I think knowing all of these good things that play can do, you would think that this is something that we're trying to help create infrastructure to allow more of and to support more of. But unfortunately, in our schools, playtime has decreased, recess has been cut, um, replaced with more didactic sessions to prepare children for tests. And there's overall an increased pressure on academic success, which has led to this overbooked schedule of you know, extracurricular activities and less free time in general. Um, and there's, in, there's a comment in the AAP um, clinical guideline talking about how uh, there's an increasing societal focus on academic readiness and that this really has been promulgated by the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 that has led us to focus on structured activities designed to promote academic results as early as preschool. Um, sending kids from preschool and kindergarten home with homework related to this. So not only is it kind of leaving our schools, there are a lot of other barriers to play that focus on achievement that we talked about the unsafe local neighborhoods and playgrounds or this idea of a nature deficit disorder. Um, there was a survey of 9,000 preschool kids and, and parents that found that only 51% of children went outside to walk or play once per day. And that 94% of parents have safety concerns about outdoor play. And the sad statistics continue that only 20% of homes are located within a half mile of a park and that 30% of US kindergarten children no longer have recess. And if there isn't recess in kindergarten, I don't know what <laughs> kindergarten is. Um, there's also the idea that there's a lot of inappropriate marketing, um, that this, you know, this new electronic toy is gonna help your kid learn seven different languages by the time they're seven type of thing. Um, promoting that, like, that these digital screens and digital toys are gonna help improve our learning. Um, and time, I think that's a big barrier that is why it's hard to have these conversations with people is that people feel like they don't have enough time and they're working multiple jobs and um, being able to sit and just play feels like a frivolous thing that they shouldn't do. And I think um, part of our job is to help counsel about that um, and media as we've talked about the presence of screens. So does screen time count as play? Well, this, it depends. <laughs> um, I think it's important for parents to understand the need that media does not often support their goals of curiosity and learning that they're thinking uh, about for their kids. Uh, screen time is often passive rather than active. And we learn more from interactive play. And I think we, we all get this 
when we were sitting listening to lectures sometimes that we would rather be doing something a little bit more interactive than listening to somebody give a lecture on, on Zoom. Um, <laughs> real learning happens better in person-to-person -person exchanges rather than machine-to-person interactions. And research shows that there's increased quality and quantity of language learning with traditional toys compared to electronic toys. And that age-appropriate media that is interactive may have some benefits, but the research continues to demonstrate that real-time social interactions remain superior for learning. So I just want to touch briefly on the idea of burnout and really the importance of adult play. Um, play can serve as an antidote to toxic stress, allowing the physiologic stress response to return to baseline. I think this is something that probably a lot of people are familiar with this it's book burnout by the Nagoski sisters um, that they wrote about um, this burnout the secret to unlocking the stress cycle and in this book they talk about how stress is not the problem it is how we deal with stress that is and they talk about completing the the idea of completing the stress cycle and the ways that we can help complete a stress cycle is through physical activity hugs kisses laughing, crying, napping, which is a good one sometimes. <laughs> um, and I'm putting playing in italicized because they didn't explicitly say playing, but a lot of the things that they talked about are all kind of components of play. And nap, I guess, too, kind of components. <laughs> um, so with that kind of segueing a little bit into physical activity, and I'll just touch upon this briefly, because I think we all know that the health benefits of physical activity are broad. Um, and there's been a huge push about decreasing the amount of sedentary time that we just spend in society in general, um, which is kind of sad how much time we have to spend thinking about it and promoting it because we have basically engineered physical activity out of our lives. So we do have to be very intentional about putting it back in. Um, and so talking to people about it and giving them specifics about their, the benefits that they can get and specific to, towards um, what they're going through will be helpful. Um, there's immediate benefits with sleep and mood and blood pressure and then long-term benefits with just decreasing the risk for a lot of these chronic conditions. Um, this is in the, the recent PAGA 2018, the Physical uh, Activity Guidelines for Americans. Um, really, this is kind of a summary of what the literature shows for benefits for different things. So in young kids, really improving their bone health and weight status, and then throughout adolescence, really improving their cognitive function, which is the big one, that upregulation of the BDNF, um, improving focus and cognitive function, and then improving just their general physical health and mental health. And then throughout adulthood, decreasing their risk for different cardiovascular disease, cancer, brain health, um, decreasing that risk of dementia and improving their weight status and decreasing the risk of this ABCD, the adiposity-based chronic diseases. So one resource that is super helpful, um, and I put this slide up here also just to remind of the recommendations, but the Move Your Way is um, a national organization that is talking about helps. It has a really nice interactive website, but and some really great patient-facing resources that you can print for people talking about how much activity they, they should be getting and how it should break down. So I think we're all familiar with the 150 minutes a week um, but I think the thing that often gets left out is the resistance training or the muscle strength. And then putting this in context for kids, it's that they should be at active at least 60 minutes every day. Um, it doesn't have to be all at once. It just needs to happen throughout their day. And when you see those stats of 13 plus hours on screen or seven plus hours, you wonder how much time a lot of these kids are getting 60 minutes. So now we'll go on to the now what. Yeah, so what can we do as providers, as individuals who are stuck in front of the screen, as parents, as friends, colleagues who, um, whose culture is dominated by, by screen time? And so obviously the first step is really recognizing it. So um, aside from the things that we listed above in this talk, um, really seeing it within ourselves and others when we're staying on or watching longer than intended. I think all of us have gone down that YouTube uh, uh, hole where we are just on for, for much longer than we thought we would be um, and just kind of recognizing a lot of these apps and websites are, are designed for that um, and so kind of recognizing that um, having others complain about the amount of time we're on screens 
neglecting our own responsibilities, having a preference for screens instead of that, those in-person connections and activities that Kendall was talking about earlier, reduced productivity, getting defensive or being secretive about the amount of time you spend on your screen, and then depression when you're off the screen. So some questions for people to ask themselves or ask themselves one, not only about their own lives, but children or friends or, or partners. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating a balanced diet? Are you getting some form of exercise every day, not just on your Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Um, am I scheduling time to, to spend with um, or, or just organically spending time with family and friends? Is my screen time mostly to stay connected with family and friends, especially during this pandemic? Um, am I still invested in my schoolwork or my work if you're not in school right now? Am I keeping up with it? I think taking a general approach to limiting your screen time, um, kind of like a basic guideline here, things to consider when you're thinking about this, uh, really starting with compassion, whether it's with your patient or yourself. Um, as like I said, Kendall was um, kind of alluding to earlier, this is a really difficult time and a lot of people find solace in their screen time, whether it's just decompressing for the day or um, trying to stay connected with people during the pandemic. And so instead of thinking of how necessarily like how can I cut it out? It's just like, how can I use it more mindfully? Keeping to a schedule. So let's say Saturdays are family days. I'm not gonna go on my phone a bunch or once I come home from work, I'm gonna really dedicate this time to just being present and with my friends or family um, or with my cat or dog or whatever. <laughs> Modeling healthy screen use, whether that's with your patients, your peers or your children. Like I said before also, just being present and then brainstorming alternatives. Let's go play tennis instead. Let's go for a walk instead of watching um, the next Disney Plus show. And kind of taking those first steps um, for parents right in the beginning, when to introduce phones. And so right now the average age in the US is around 10 or 11 years old. Kendall and I right before this talk, we're actually talking about the screen time for um, infants and how that, that what was the average one was suggested time for um, three months old it was two hours yeah two hours of screen time for three month olds um that's pretty that's astounding <laughs> um so trying to remember and also counseling our patients not to use screens as pacifiers for children or babysitters or to stop tantrums um, trying to turn off all screens during meals and outings and really setting a curfew or time limit for yourself for that screen use uh, we have smart TVs these days, so there is a, a timer on a lot of TVs these days that it's like you set it for one hour and it will just shut off and lock you out afterwards. And it's the same thing that goes for apps. I'm kind of alluding to that, really learning how to use technology to your benefit and in non-pathological ways. Um, so using apps and settings that will kick you off or keep things locked while you're supposed to be productive or, or present, deleting apps off your phone, um, kind of making yourself have that extra step to check something if it's not really pertinent to your life, um, but it's just like a way to distract yourself. So getting rid of that distraction altogether and getting those screen time notifications. I'm not sure if smart TVs have this aspect yet, but definitely on your phones, it will give you a summary of like, hey, this is what you spent uh, doing on your phone this week, um, whether that's Netflix or, or Haiku <laughs> or something else like that. So can we use technology to facilitate opportunities for play and physical activity? Um, I think there's not, there's no taking technology out of our lives now. And a lot of us maybe are even using different things already or wearing these items that are helping with physical activity or notifying you that you're not as physically active as you should be right now. Um, but I think like Kim was talking about, we really need to be intentional and mindful about how we're integrating them into our lives. And if we're using technology to help with play or physical activity, is it still giving us that interaction and social connection that helps uh, really bring a lot of the benefits um, for physical activity and play? And I think this is particularly uh, true in our current attention market. And I really like this quote by Dr. Alajid Williams, who is a neurologist and founder of this wonderful organization, Hip Hop Public Health. He says, one of the most scarce commodities in our world today is human attention, um, which is 
let's just pause there and let that sit in because it's it's really it's really sad that maybe even as we pause here somebody got bored and checked their phone or something because it's just how we are kind of how culture is right now unfortunately um what they the model that they use for hip-hop public health um, is this multi-sensory, multi-level health education model, which is, model, which is a kind of a mouthful to say, but really it emphasizes integrating the science in the context of culture and art, um, and really using music and dance as a huge role for this. And they've created different programs using hip-hop music and dance to teach kids about healthy lifestyles. Um, bring it up, one, because this is a great resource to use, um, to uh, for patients to use you can tell them about it but i think it is also a really good example of how we are using technology and screen time to help promote play and physical activity um, with our kids but also with adults because what they're doing is they're um you know it's kind of similar to those like videos maybe you remember seeing in school and except for they were like horribly done videos <laughs> and you're like wait this was made 20 years before we were in school this is this feels a little bit more relevant <laughs> And it's this idea of this child-centric model too, where we're teaching our youth kind of these healthy habits and then they bring it home and they're helping to bring it towards to their families and implementing it there. Um, so here are just some provider resources. And we kind of alluded to this as our ob objectives at the beginning of writing play prescriptions and exercise or physical activity prescriptions. Um, and the recommendation from that AAP clinical report was really that we should one screen for this, which we're often doing about how much screen time they have or how physically active they are with our, the dial or the equivalent um, like screening we're doing for kids. But then in adults, we're not always asking these questions or asking about how physically active they are. Um, but there is this idea of the physical activity vital sign. Um, nobody's really coined the play vital sign yet, but that's something <laughs> you could integrate just to see how much play they have in their life. Um, but seeing how much cardio they're getting to also the resistance part. And then with a lot of these studies, and I've seen this more in relationship to physical activity, is that providers are often hesitant to spend a lot of time counseling on um, the importance of physical activity, which is multifactorial, partly related to they feel, one, they don't have enough time, two, their patients aren't going to do it, or three, they don't feel totally prepared to give these specific recommendations. Um, and I think that um, the, the, the thing that the research, the research shows a lot is that if we're able to give very specific um, recommendations and then have a specific timeline for follow-up, um, patients have improvement with that. Um, so there's the prescription, you could do this just on any form where you're just using um, blank paper to write play more or, you know, go outside 20 minutes each day and play a game of your choice type of thing, or for physical activity, make it very specific of what, how much aerobic and how much strength and help them with the build-up plans. Um, some resources that for yourself, but also that you can share with your, with your um, patients are this hip hop public health. And maybe if time allows the distraction <laughs> with a <laughs> screw down with maybe we'll play one of the music videos. Um, and then this move your way activity planner uh, is a really great interactive one for parents to do with their kids or for you to do just on your own. Um, and here are some additional resources that we can go through and references. And before we maybe go out with our, our play song, we can take any questions that people may have. Thanks, Claire. Or the, I don't know if you, uh, I'm on a phone to answer a question. <laughs> How do you do nothing? This is awesome. So to, to send you off, we'll uh, just play one of the music oh wait is any did somebody have a question <laughs> okay well thank you all for uh joining us this morning we'll leave you with one of the music videos <laughs> Maybe.